and the hope that this morning brings for each and every one of us. And so this morning, we, we hope that for you, you will discover that important, lifelong peace and hope that the resurrection of Jesus Christ brings to our lives. I want to go over a few announcements this morning. If you have your bulletin, you can pop them open there. First of all, if you are visiting this morning and haven't been with us before, or even if you have, we have a welcome card here that we encourage you to take some time and fill out. It has some information about our morning services and, and, and things that happen here at our church, but you can fill out your name and some information there, as well as some prayer requests on back. And when you do that, as, after you're done, you can tear the card in half, take the part you filled out, and you can uh, basically you can put it into one of our uh, welcome card boxes at our exits. You can put it into the offering envelope or into the offering plates there when they go by or drop them off at our welcome desk in the gymnasium. We thank you for doing that in advance. This morning, as it is a holiday weekend, we do not have any children's uh, ministry going on downstairs. We invite the children to stay with, together with their families. However, if you're thinking, oh no, my child's going to be, be bugging me all service, we do have some activity sheets at the back here, some Easter activity sheets right at the back of the sanctuary here in the box, aptly marked activity sheets, and you can take a pack of crayons there too to, uh, to, uh, to entertain them. Coming up, we want to look ahead. Next Sunday is a really important Sunday as we come together to uh, celebrate Greg and Rachel's ministry here with us. It'll be our last, uh, our last Sunday with them, and we're also going to have some baptisms, which is really exciting, as we just had some in February. So make sure to come back. That's next, next Sunday at 11 a.m., and after the service, we're going to have some time together uh, in the gymnasium. So bring some sandwiches, some, some fruit or a veggie tray, and uh, we'll come together and celebrate there next Sunday morning. A reminder again, on May 5th, we have our upcoming leadership forum. That's at 12.30 p.m. Uh, it's our leadership forum continuing on from March, so make sure you come out and attend that. You can see a list of our weekly activities there on the left-hand side, and so I won't go over them all, but feel free to take a look and peruse them. The marriage retreat that we do every year is coming up May 17th to the 19th. Contact Tim and Francis there for more information. The number's in the bulletin. Daryl and Laura Lee Buston WMS Group will meet in the parlor on Thursday, April 25th at 2 p.m. Young at Heart, we have a new event coming up for you. This is a games luncheon on Thursday, May 9th, not too long away, from 12 to 2 p.m. You can bring your favorite table games. If you have a classic one that you haven't played in a while, bring that out. Pizza will be provided for lunch, and the cost is $5. You can see the information there and sign up starting today in the gymnasium. Passion for Little People is hosting a paint night fundraiser on Thursday, May 9th at 6.30 in the gym. Cost is $30 per person. It's a fantastic opportunity to fundraise and really create some art. So come on out to that and you can look at more information there from Amy Clark. And if you are a student looking for a summer job, uh, Highfield does have seed positions available. We do have seed positions available. So if you have a seed voucher, you can visit the website uh, NBC there to apply. We'd love to have you apply to here for the summer. We do have a number of sympathies we want to express. It was a tough week for our church as a number of people associated with Highfield who are members of Highfield did pass away. So we want to pass along our sympathies to the families of, uh, to the family of Cecil and Diane Jones on the passing of Diane this past Monday, to the family of Joyce Milton on her passing this past week. And we also now want to express sympathies to the family of Frank Robinson as well. I do have some uh, who has passed away just recently. I do have some funeral details for you that did not make it into the bulletin as it was printed beforehand. So Frank, uh, for Frank Robinson, the funeral will be at Ferguson's home, Ferguson's funeral home on Tuesday, April 23rd at 11 a.m. That's Tuesday, April 23rd at 11 a.m. Visitation is April 22nd, Monday, April 22nd from 2 to 4 and 7 to 9 also at Ferguson's. Folks, it is hard to hear of these passings, but as I said, we have a hope that conquers all things, and today we celebrate our risen Lord Savior who conquered death and toppled Satan's power. At this time, I'd like to call a group of ladies forward who are going to lead us in our call to worship this morning, and I'm excited to have them come lead us now. Mark 16, verse 1. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. 
When they entered to the dump, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they left his body. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and uh, bewildering, and uh, they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Shall we pray? Our Father, we come to you this morning with our praise and gratitude because of who you are and how you have blessed us. Holy Spirit, we know you are here with us because your word tells us that when we gather like this, you are in our midst. Amen. Guide our worship, we pray, for we ask it in the name of Jesus, our living Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to start by singing Christ the Lord is Risen Today, and this really shows us the hope that's in us and why we are here today and why we are celebrating. So please stand with us. Hosanna. Yeah. 
we're going to keep singing Crown Him with Many Crowns. be seated. Do you believe this morning that he is risen to save us from our sin, to save us from sin's grasp? Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. As we continue our worship service, I am delighted to inform you that we have an update from our mission team in Honduras. If you've been wondering how they're doing, Mark has recorded a short message to us on this, our, our, our day that we celebrate the risen Lord. And we'd like to play that for you now. We've, they've had a bit of a tough time over the past week. We've had a, a couple of uh, individuals, uh, Shelly and Marilda, both who had fallen sick and had been a little ill this past week and are now just starting to recover. So we thank you for your prayers for them in advance and we ask you to continue to pray for them. Let's hear this update now from Mark about what's going on in Honduras. Hello Highfield, happy Easter. Uh, it's Saturday up in the mountains, and we were given, uh, sending out a blessing early. Uh, this is a small church. Uh, it's really high up in the mountains, over 1,600 meters above sea level. Uh, we have delivered some clothing today and some gifts and toys and some candy uh, to the 45-plus children that are in this little community. Um, we really appreciate your support. 
and uh, thank you for your prayers while we've been here. Uh, there's been some sickness, and uh, everybody's on the mend now. And uh, also, um, the project is going to be starting here next week uh, with some tiles on the floor. Uh, our projects have been delayed because of sickness and because of uh, other uh, challenges that we've had this week. Uh, but we hope to paint the uh, church in Honduras on Monday uh, and be back up here in the mountains on Wednesday or Thursday of next week to uh, do some tile work. So continue to pray for us and, and a big happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you very much. Yes, please do keep them in your prayers as they continue to work in the big project that's coming up this week. At this time, we'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to take up this morning's tithes and offerings. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, this morning as we celebrate your resurrected Son, we have so much to be thankful for. For that hope and that peace that he brought. For that gift of eternal life and salvation that was given to us. Lord, we thank you for that gift. We thank you for your unconditional love that was demonstrated on the cross. And this morning as we continue to celebrate he who has risen, he who has given us this new life, Lord, we offer these gifts to you now as a thanks, as a gratitude of our appreciation, as a token of our thanks to you. And Lord, we know it's not enough. But Father, please accept these gifts. And as we continue to celebrate here this morning, be in our presence, be in our midst, and bless all that happens. In your Son's awesome name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. I was 
an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name I ran out of that grave Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning humbly before you as your people. We know that your love never fails. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Your mercies are new every morning. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of your praise. Lord, we confess our sin before you today, and we continually need your forgiveness. We come trusting before you your promise that in 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Lord, as we come before you this Easter Sunday, we thank you for the victory and the power in your name. Thank you that you hold the keys over death, that by your almighty power, Jesus was raised from the dead. We also thank you for your great plan of salvation for us through Jesus' life, his death and resurrection, paving the way for us to have a new life with you. Thank you for giving us a Lord, a conqueror, a victor, a redeemer, a deliverer and a friend in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, give your special attention today to those that are sick, especially those in our congregation who are in hospital. We know we have a number of them, Lord, that are not well. Minister and meet the needs of our shut-ins, Lord, who cannot be with us this morning. Minister to those who are grieving and hurting, especially to those who have recently lost loved ones who have passed away. Lord, lay your hand on those who need to feel your presence today. Minister to each of their needs. Lord, we ask that we would continue to trust in you, even in the midst of our circumstances, no matter what goes on in our lives, Lord. And in doing so, others might be see the need and be drawn to you, Lord, as they watch us. Lord, we pray, uh, be with our Pastor Geary as he brings us your word today, so that the words you give him would speak to us and draw us into deeper and stronger relationship with you. And finally, Lord, please take us and use us in your work here on earth committing ourselves to your work, putting you first and foremost, and living a life that is pleasing to you. We pray this now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died, was buried, then rose again in victory from the grave. 
Amen. This morning we have the privilege of having Pastor Gary Barr and his wife Debbie with us. Uh, Pastor Gary grew up here at Highfield and was at one time our associate pastor to seniors. And he and Debbie are both retired and they enjoy traveling. And they live here right here in Moncton, if you don't know who they are. So please welcome Pastor Gary as he brings us the Easter message today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Andrew, and thank you for that warm welcome. And I got a word for you this morning, and it's wow, because the worship team led us well this morning, and it was an awesome experience. And you prepared us and readied our hearts uh, to hear the word now. So we're going to look at the word this morning, and uh, we're going to look at, again, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Uh, thank you to the ladies who read the scripture this morning, but I think I'm going to read it again, uh, just so that we're ready and uh, we can uh, concentrate again uh, on those particular words in Mark. If you're able, would you stand with me this morning as we read God's word? Reading from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. You may be seated. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Well, as we look at the accounts of the resurrection, each gospel writer gives us a different viewpoint of the resurrection. So while the fundamental aspects of the resurrection are the same, some of the details are a bit different. And that's because it was a real event witnessed and recorded by different people. So it makes sense that there are a few, some, some subtle variations in the four accounts. And I've chosen the Gospel of Mark this morning because of its variances. It gives us some critical information to consider as we meditate this morning on the resurrection. All across this world, in, in churches everywhere, they're packed to overflowing, and it's Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. We've come through Holy Week where we looked at the triumphal entry and, and then to the crucifixion. And today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. The point where our eternal hope was initiated. Yet you know the first Easter morning, it begins in darkness. There was a darkness of despair and discouragement. A darkness of, why did he die, and what's going to happen now? There was a darkness in a mother who had lost a son. There was a darkness in a group of devoted followers who had given their life, but they had lost their leader. I want you to take a little journey with me this morning. And I want you to pretend with me that we're on the road to the tomb. And we're with the group of women that are going there who are on their way that first Easter to the tomb to perform their final act of respect to the one that they had faithfully followed and who now, at least in their minds, had left them for good and their hope was now gone. What an empty feeling 
that must have been. They had followed Jesus for a few years now and they provided what they could to sustain him. And they saw things. They saw the miracles. They saw people be healed. They saw people come to the kingdom. And they came to believe. They believed that in fact he was the Messiah that they had waited for for their entire lives. But as they observed his body being taken down from the cross, it was lifeless and bloody and beaten and disfigured. They wrapped his body in a linen shroud and they placed him in a borrowed tomb. Their hopes were dashed. You see, they didn't know at that point, like we do today, how the story ends. I suspect it was a long, quiet, and painful walk in the early morning shortly after sunrise. They surely were confused, full of despair and brokenhearted over the loss of their master. Easter is an incredible time to declare Jesus is risen and he is alive. Yet you know in the eyes of the world things about Jesus are kind of fuzzy. They're not understood well. Jesus is misunderstood. But the Gospel of Mark, Mark makes it very clear who Jesus is. It's one of the best scripture books to find out and to meet who Jesus is. Now Mark's Gospel is, is the shortest of the four Gospels. There are only 661 verses. And only 23 of those verses are unique to Mark. Which means, of course, they're not recorded in Matthew, Luke, or John. So why did I just spend time telling you that? Because when Mark does that, it's critically important to us. We gather some very valuable information. We, we gather some insight that isn't anywhere else. Like we're, what we're going to look at in chapter 16 this morning. For instance, do you know that Mark tells more miracle stories than any of the other Gospels? And he does that because I believe Mark was caught up in the wonderment and the amazement of who Jesus is. He was caught up in the power of Jesus. So in this portion of the 16th chapter I read for you this morning, we can learn some things that weren't unique only to that place and time, but have relevance for us today as we consider the significance of that first Easter morning. And the first thing I want you to know this morning is that God wants to and can use everyone. There's a verse that doesn't appear anywhere else in the gospel. Much of the story is the same, but there's something different in what Mark says. Look with me at verse 3, which he says, And they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now that question doesn't appear anywhere else in the scriptural accounts of the resurrection. They all talk about the women going to the tomb, but only once is this question asked, who's going to roll the stone away? It's a logical question. It's a simple question. It makes sense. Let me tell you why that's important this morning. One of the women's name on the way to the tomb was Mary Magdalene. And if anyone going to the tomb that morning understood the power of Jesus, it was surely her. Do you know her background? Well, the Bible tells us a bit about her. In Luke at chapter 8, verses 1 to 2, it says this, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, were told she's a woman filled with seven demons. So that tells us this morning that at some very important juncture in her life, she encountered the healing power of Jesus. He set her free from not one, not two, but seven demons. We actually know she's from Magdala. It's close to the Sea of Galilee. And actually her last name was not Magdalene. It simply denoted where she was from. Now, that's not a small thing to have seven demons. It means that she was totally under the power of these demons. She was imprisoned by them and totally under their control. You know something? I think she was a woman who at some point found herself in a totally hopeless state. 
In other words, she had no chance whatsoever until Jesus showed up one day. Isn't it always amazing when Jesus shows up? Because she knew what it was to be set free. You see, the amazing thing about Mary Magdalene is that when Jesus rolled the stone away from her life, she followed. In fact, she followed him everywhere. She's the one that was with Jesus at the trial and the crucifixion and the resurrection. And when we follow her a bit, we find that she was in fact places where Jesus' mother wasn't even. And I think it's because when Jesus sets you free, you've been given hope. And your life is changed. When Jesus sets you free, you want to follow him. You want to step by step, be in step, and be by his side. Now Mary's mentioned 14 times in the New Testament. Eight of these times she's with other women. But interestingly, every time her name is always listed first. Now, in Jewish writing, the first name listed always carried the most significance. So when the gospel writers used her name first, it meant that she was of some importance. In the remaining references, she's with Jesus. So think about that for a moment. Here's a woman, had seven demons, who had been set free, and now it's the morning of the resurrection, and God could have revealed the resurrection story of hope to anyone that he chose. Certainly there were any number of important people he could have had come to the tomb and revealed to them for the very first time for all of mankind to hear that he is alive, he's risen, he's not dead. I mean it would have made perfect sense to send one of the disciples, maybe a governor or some other official. But he chooses this woman with a very sordid past. And I absolutely think God used her because of who she is. Isn't it incredible that, that God could have used anyone? Yet in his divine plan, he chooses a woman that had been imprisoned in the deepest of ways. Who knew what it was like to be hopeless. And he entrusted to her the most significant message of proclaiming he's alive. He entrusted her to give that message to others. Well, you know what? This morning, he entrusts that same message to us. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus says, And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. It's clear who Jesus is inviting here. Anyone is inclusive. Anyone means everyone. Being a disciple of Christ, being used of God, is not for the religious superstars. It's not for the morally upright. It's not for those people who seemingly have their lives together. Yet sadly, you know, many people don't understand the invitation. And they don't take the invitation seriously. They feel there's a, there's a fine print somewhere that excludes me. God doesn't need me. God doesn't want me on his team. But look at that familiar verse of Matthew 28, 19 that says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I don't see where it says some of you go. It's a blanket invitation for all who believe. To, as you go on your life's journey, we are to be proclaimers of the good news and make disciples. And in Acts 1.8 it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. <coughs> and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Again, there are no exclusions here. God calls all of us and he wants to use all of us. And just like Mary Magdalene, we too are called to proclaim that the tomb is empty. And like her on this Resurrection Sunday, we can come to the empty tomb and we can see that the tomb is empty. And in wonder and in amazement and with thanksgiving, go and tell that he is risen, that he is alive, and he is at work in the world today. That's our message. Well, the second thing that we see out of this story is 
our failures don't have to be fatal. And so as the narrative continues, there's a, another unique thing that Mark tells us, and that's in verse 7. And it says that Mary was told to tell the disciples and Peter. What's up with that? We know Peter's a disciple. Why would Mark do that? None of the other gospel writers do that. It would make sense to say, go tell the disciples and maybe Herod or Pilate or somebody. Could it be that Peter in particular needed to hear? Is it possible that no one needed to hear the good news of Jesus' resurrection more than him? Remember, Peter was living with the fact at this point that he had denied Jesus three times, and he did it publicly. When Jesus needed him the most, Peter had denied that he even knew Jesus. And he did it publicly not once, not twice, but he did it three times. And in Luke's account, as Peter denied him for the third time, Jesus turns and he looks at Peter, and realizing what he had done, Peter broke down and he wept. And we read in Luke 22, 61 and 62, The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you'll disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter was no doubt living in the tomb of failure. Can you imagine how he might have felt? Yet, it's as if Jesus wanted him specifically to know. Hey, Peter, I'm alive. It's okay, Peter. There's hope for you. And later, Jesus gives Peter another chance, and we know Jesus restores him so that he can carry out the next assignment Jesus has for him when Jesus meets him on the seashore after the resurrection and tells Peter to go feed my sheep. And in this way, Mark shows us a, a tiny glimpse, a, a picture of what happens to us in our sin. I'm pretty sure this morning that most of you are like me, and that you look back and you wish you could make some decisions differently. That you could take some different actions in your life, and particularly when it comes to our relationship with God. You see, our sin is what keeps us in prison. Our sin keeps us in a tomb and, and we can't give up or we give up. We see no escape and we lose hope. You may be here this morning and you might be crying out from the very depths of your soul, who can roll the stone away for me in my life? I need help with a bad relationship. Who can change my marriage? Who can help with my children? I'm struggling with life in general. I want you to know this morning that on your own we cannot change the imprisoning circumstances in our lives. But I'm here to tell you this morning the risen Jesus can and the risen Jesus wants to. He can roll the stone of our imprisonment away. God can change your life regardless of where you've been or what you may have done. And let me remind you of something today. Why did the stone get rolled away that morning? The stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out. He didn't need that. It was rolled away so that the women could go in. The stone was rolled away to give them a newfound hope. The stone was rolled away to let us in so we can see and experience that the tomb is empty. To let us in and give us a newfound hope. And by doing so, his power is revealed to us. Some of you here today might be imprisoned by some things from your past. You've made some mistakes and you've messed up. It's kind of like spilling something on the new Chesterfield and turning the cushion over so nobody will be able to see what you've done. My friends, we all have stains in our lives. We're all, we've all done something that leaves a mark. And we think, why would Jesus want us on his side? There's no way he could use someone like me after the things I've done. If you're weighed down by the guilt of your past, 
and you feel that God could never forgive you, that he could never ever use you, I've got a message and a promise for you today. If he can roll the stone away that cover the grave of our Lord Jesus Christ, he can roll your stone of shame or guilt or whatever it might be away today too. Totally out of your life and you can be set free on this Easter Sunday. And he can make you into a new person. That's what the resurrection is about. He can change anything. And our, our failures don't have to be fatal. You don't have to live behind the stone of your tomb. Truth is, we've all been entombed. Remember what Scripture says about us before we came to Christ in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. It says we were dead in our trespasses. Where do dead people hang out? In a tomb. We are dead in our sins before Christ. You see, we all needed someone to roll the stone away for us. And who did that for us? God did it. And he is in the business of transforming lives. And no one is excluded from what he can do. Tim Keller sums it up for us this way. Here's the gospel, he says. You're more sinful than you ever dared believe. You're more loved than you ever dared hope. You know, the truth is this morning, we all know what it's like to be a Mary Magdalene or a Peter at some point in our life. With no escape, no way to fix it on our own, yet God stepped in full of grace and mercy and he's given us life, a new life, and that life came to us through the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the Bible's right full of people who got second and third chances and more. So whatever your stone is this morning, he wants to roll it away now. And he can, and he can do it today. The resurrection is our guarantee of that. It is the resurrection of Jesus that guarantees that no matter how you failed God in the past, no matter how serious you might think that failure is, your, fa your failure is not fatal because our God is the God of second chances. they didn't find what they were looking for. They discovered something much better. They discovered new life and new hope. They discovered that he's alive. So what's our response to the empty tomb? I want you to look at the picture that's coming up on the screen. 
And where the stone is, there's line number one. And imagine that your name is there. And then I want you to give consideration to the second line. And in doing so, I want you to visualize that which is holding back. The stone of your tomb. Might be fear, it might be guilt, I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, Jesus can roll that stone away and he can set you free. And it doesn't matter what you've listed on the stone of your life, I promise you this, our God is bigger than anything you might put on that stone. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He can roll it away. Every stone that's in the room this morning can be rolled away. He's bigger and stronger than all the prisons we build for ourselves, and He's mightier than anything we've got going on. God changes us so whatever it is that's keeping you from a stronger relationship with Him, He can move it, and He can move it today. We simply need to ask. Because He's the God who hears the cries of His people. Friends, God rules stones away. And God changes lives not just for now, but for all of eternity. Now, we don't really know what happened to Mary. Tradition tells us she went to Rome after Jesus ascended back to heaven. But we too, like her, are witnesses to the resurrection. Because he has rolled the stone away for us. He's changed your life and he's restored your life. And I believe today that we have the same power that's described in Romans 8.11 that says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. The power that rose Jesus from the dead is at work in us and it lives in us. So there's nothing stopping you this morning except the stone that we need to give over right now. So here's my question this morning. You know, if you remember, I always have a question. So you know we're coming to a close. What's the stone? What is the stone you need to ask him to roll away for you this morning? You see, the fact is he already knows what it is. And for sure you know what it is. And I believe on this Easter Sunday morning it can be a new day in your relationship with him. God can move whatever it is that imprisons you, and your life will never be the same again. The story Mark has told us about Jesus is the story of the salvation of the world. And today we celebrate the resurrection of the one Mark calls the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Son of God. And we, like the women, must tremble with amazement when we come to the empty tomb. It's the empty tomb where our hope is found, not just for the present, but for all of eternity. My friends, Christ is risen. As the worship team comes, we're going to pray. And I want you to give some, consider some serious consideration this morning to those things that we've talked about. Father God, as we come before you, we're reminded of the significance of today. You sent your Son and you allowed him to die for us so that we can be part of the redemption story by way of the empty tomb. We pray today that as we examine ourselves, as we consider our relationship with you, God, with every head bowed and eyes closed, we ask that you remove from us that which is keeping us from your full blessing. Those things that hinder us from the fulfillment of our relationship with you. So, Father, on this Easter Sunday, we commit ourselves afresh to you in gratitude for what you've done for us as we loudly proclaim together, He is risen. Let's stand and sing together. This is the resurrection day. This is Easter. This is a happy day. So let's sing this song together.
our song, isn't it? What a blessed time it has been to be with you this morning uh, as we celebrate the resurrection. And as we go this morning, I leave you with a piece of scripture. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.